Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Margaret Mims from the Department of Learning and Interpretation here at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston. You're probably wondering, why is the stage floor covered in cardboard and plastic? Well, every two years, excuse me, is this weather, uh, the River Oaks Garden Club, the Garden Club of Houston, and the Museum of Fine Arts present a multi-day event called Fluorescence which is one of the largest competitive flower shows in the country. So as part of fluorescence, Joseph Massey, who's widely regarded as one of Europe's top botanical artists, will be doing a series of demonstrations right here in Brown Auditorium. And of course, those demonstrations not only will have flowers, but they're going to have a lot of water. So we, we've just protected the floor. But one of the most delightful aspects of fluorescence, um, at least to me, is walking through the museum's galleries and seeing the over-the-top creative flower arrangements that some of the fluorescence participants have created in response to specific works in the museum's galleries. The flower arrangements are usually on a pedestal near the work of art, so it's a very unique dialogue between flowers and works of art. So if you come to the museum on Tuesday or Wednesday of this week, Fluorescence will be in full swing, and you'll be able to treat, your, treat yourself to a little walk through the galleries to see these wonderful flower confections. <laughs> so that's what, this is just one part of that whole multi-day event. But back to today, welcome back to those of you who have joined us for our lectures in celebration of the extraordinary exhibition here at our museum, Vincent Van Gogh, His Life in Art. Today is the final lecture in the 43rd Ruth K. Shardle Lecture Series, an annual series of lectures funded through a generous grant from the Brown Foundation here in Houston. Ruth Shardle was a longtime museum benefactor, known for the joy with which she approached life, for her intellectual curiosity, and for the enthusiasm with which she championed creative accomplishments, which, as I said last week, I think is exactly the spirit that we celebrate in the work of Vincent van Gogh. So please, let's give the Brown Foundation one more and one final round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Now, one of the details that we wrote into our grant proposal for the Ruth K. Shardle Lectures, and we've done this for the past 10 years, is that the lectures will be posted online so that you and anyone anywhere can enjoy and savor the wonderful insights that our speakers bring to the works of artists whose work we think we know and yet who never fail to, to reveal more to us every time we, we look more closely. So far, the first three lectures in this five-part series are posted online on YouTube. Those are the talks by Ninka Bakker, the senior curator at the Van Gogh Museum on the opening day, the talk by Gloria Groom on Van Gogh's bedrooms, the three paintings that he did of the bedroom in his yellow house in Arles, David Bomford's talk on Van Gogh's, uh, the, um, the Van Gogh in our collection, The Rocks, which is in the Beck Collection of Impressionist and Post-Impressionist Art. And in addition, you will find on this YouTube channel, David Bomford's talk on Van Gogh's materials and techniques, which explored Van Gogh's work from the viewpoint of what we've learned about Van Gogh's working methods um, and from David's viewpoint as a conservation scientist his other hat in addition to being curator. You'll also find David's members lecture, which was a great overview of the exhibition. So, and a few other lectures from other exhibitions. So, uh, and, and very soon we hope to have George Shackelford's brilliant lecture last week, Starry Nights, Sunny Days, Van Gogh in Provence. So how do you find these lectures on YouTube? Well, Margaret made a little cheat sheet. It's very simple. It's right outside the auditorium door as you exit with the, the door you didn't come in, but the door on the opposite side. And, or just Google YouTube, and then when you get to the home page in the search bar, put MFAH docent, D-O-C-E-N-T, because we created this channel so docents could review their material. But look for that, um, look for those instructions, and I hope you enjoy. Don't, this isn't broadcast television, but the sound is real good because it comes directly out of the PA system. But I want you to know that even though today is the final talk in the Ruth K. Shardle Lecture Series, thanks to the Virginia and Ira Jackson Endowment here at the museum for lectures related to prints and drawings, 
which the, uh, of which the, the Jacksons were passionate collectors of prints and drawings. There will be another Van Gogh lecture on Thursday, June the 20th at 6.30 p.m., which is exactly one week before the exhibition closes on Thursday, June 27th. Uh, I know it's odd timing to close on a Thursday, but the, the way the contract was, we could have the works on view for 110 days. So from the opening day to Thursday, June 27th is exactly 110 days. <laughs> but drawing was always integral to Van Gogh's artistic practice. Uh, from his novice days as an artist um, to, to his final days in the south of France. And so that will be the subject of uh, Marjorie Shelley's uh, lecture. Uh, she's the conservator in charge of works on paper at the Metropolitan Museum. So please join us on Thursday, June the 20th for our final talk related to the Van Gogh exhibition. But this afternoon, our focus is Van Gogh's fascination with 19th century Japanese woodblock prints. Van Gogh never traveled to Japan, but nonetheless, we cannot truly appreciate Van Gogh's work without understanding the impact that the arrival of Japanese art in Paris in the middle of the 19th century had on artists, especially on Van Gogh. I'm delighted to welcome as our speaker this afternoon, Dr. Louis Van Tilburg, senior researcher at the Van Gogh Museum and professor in art history specializing in Van Gogh at the University in Amsterdam. Dr. Van Tilburg joined the staff of the Van Gogh Museum in 1986, where he's worked in the exhibitions department, as head of the library and documentation center, as head of collections, as curator of paintings, and most recently, as senior, senior researcher. He's published widely on Van Gogh, and, he, and he'll know how to pronounce Van Gogh correctly, not, not the American way that Margaret does, and he's curated and co-curated many exhibitions on the artist, including the major retrospective of Van Gogh's work mounted in 1990 on the 100th anniversary of Van Gogh's death, the exhibition Millet and Van Gogh at the Musée d'Orsay in Paris, the exhibition Becoming Van Gogh that was at the Denver Art Museum, the exhibition On the Verge of Insanity, Van Gogh and His Illness at the Van Gogh Museum, and the exhibition that provides the springboard for his talk today, Van Gogh in Japan, which was on view at the Van Gogh Museum just last year, and will be the subject of one of our armchair travel exhibition on screen films in June. <laughs> um, followed, following Dr. Van Tilburg's talk, we do have a gallery concert today featuring works by, in line with the theme of his talk, which is Van Gogh in Japan, featuring works by European composers around the time of Van Gogh who were influenced by the sounds and the stories of non-European cultures. The concert is titled Exoticism in European Music Around the Time of Van Gogh and will take place in the large express abstract expressionist gallery adjacent to the exit of the Van Gogh exhibition. So our theme will continue on for another 30 minutes or so once the concept, concert begins. But now please join me in giving Dr. Louis Van Tilburg a big welcome to Houston. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret, for your kind words. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm a bit jet-lagged, uh, <laughs> so I hope I will not stumble uh, uh, on my words. Um, to start with Van Gogh, uh, we pronounce him Van Gogh, but I will say like you, Van, Van Gogh, <laughs> uh, uh, Van Gogh, uh, because I'm used to it. And must remember that everybody stumbled about the word Van Gogh uh, in, fr in France as well. That's the reason why all his pictures are Saint Vincent. That's much better, because in every language it's the same, more or less. Um, so, uh, let me start immediately with the question why you are here and I'm here, uh, and that's the question, why is Van Gogh so important? Why, why is he so attractive that people like you uh, want to come here and that, that I'm even invited from Amsterdam to tell him something about him? Well, let me see if I'm doing this right. Yeah, I am. Well, he's called, he's called by some as a global rock star. And um, to a certain extent, that's totally right, because, well, 
you know what it is with global rock stars. Everybody admires them. Uh, they're we all well known, and you want to share something uh, of them because they are celebrities. Um, And that means, if you are a celebrity, that your work, for instance, in the case of a hawk, that your works even be uh, used uh, for dresses, for shows in, uh, in, in, in Holland, uh, as this one is. Um, and in the case of a hawk, we all know that there's even a museum uh, uh, for him, which is built in Holland, and which houses uh, a large uh, collection by him, the Van Gogh Museum. This is a photograph of uh, when it was uh, being built somewhere in the 70s, and it opened its door in 73. Uh, so there is this, there is, uh, 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 so there is this museum. There are works spread all, all over the world, which is very important uh, if you want to create uh, uh, some fame uh, for uh, for his work. And um, the, uh, his works do fetch prices that are uh, beyond uh, uh, everybody's uh, uh, belief. So that's 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 how it is. Uh, why you are more or less here. Nevertheless, the word global uh, rock star is a bit strange in the sense that he's not a rock star, he's uh, an artist. And of course, the word global rock star is something I tend to think from uh, the last 10, 20 years, when for some reason we uh, tend to express, uh, uh, we, we believe that, that uh, belonging to uh, a, a society who is full of admiration for celebrities, is, that's important. And it's changed over the years. So this is a photograph, for instance, that was that you could take in 1945. And it's a photograph of a work of Van Gogh. It's not in the show, but it is in our museum. And it's taken in the, the Museum of Modern Art in uh, Holland. And I do not know who the shoes are that we see here. Probably from the, uh, the, the person who made the photograph, I tend to think, or the director. Uh, but it's quite funny to uh, see that a uh, work of Van Gogh is put near the, uh, the heating system. <laughs> and this kind of photograph is not possible anymore. The kind of photographs that we have nowadays and we spread all over the world are these kind of photographs. Um, and I can assure you that the picture that you see in the back is not the real thing, but it is, it is a reproduction. Against this, uh, um, the, the, the fact that Van Gogh uh, has become so uh, well known, become a global uh, a rock star, it's been all uh, th that's been been uh, that's been true for many many years. It started already early in the in, in the twentieth century, uh, after his letters were being pub uh, published, that he became too popular. Uh, people got angry. Even, uh, so this is a photograph of fists that were made during the exhibition that I organized or co-authored in, in 1990 because they believed that uh, the commercialization of Van Gogh went too far. Uh, and that's of all, of all times. Nevertheless, there's something in it because if you talk about a global rock star, you do not uh, tend to think that you're talking about um, um, that you do not value, uh, 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 no, let me put this otherwise. This is the jet lag, I'm sorry. Uh, what, what's important is, of course, that uh, if you value the work of an artist, uh, you have to go back why he became an, uh, a famous artist in the first place. And that is, of course, his works. So if we want to learn something, we have to go back to his works. And this is uh, a cartoon of a person who made uh, an, a nice, uh, book about Van Gogh, and uh, she, st she started with simply going to the museum. <coughs> oh, this goes too far. So this is a nice quote, because Van Gogh, why is he important if you would uh, to, uh, 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 if you want to put it into words? Well, it's a quote by Pablo Picasso, who simply says that, beginning with Van Gogh, however great we may be, we are all in, in a measure autodidacts. You might almost say primitive painters. Painters no longer live within a tradition, and so each one of us must recreate an entire language. Every painter of our times is fully authorized to create that language. No criterion can be applied to him, to him uh, a priori, since we do not believe in rigid standards any longer. So, 
what is it uh, uh, what is this about well this is about the fact that he created an entire language so the question becomes what was the language in van gogh's case well here we see a nice cartoon of steinbeck who says that uh, you have a kind of identity as an artist you have a kind of fingerprint uh, and what would that be in the case of van gogh then you can even well no, i'm not going to say that um, if you would read the letters of Van Gogh, he says a lot of things in those letters, but one of the things is that he does not believe in, uh, in talent, more or less. He says that you have to work very hard, and maybe something as talent does really exist, but in principle you uh, 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 become somebody by simply working very hard. So you become a painter by painting. So, so what does this mean? Well, people admired something in his work, and the question is for us that after we admire, uh, after we have uh, uh, more or less dwelt on the question what the wow is, that we should dwell later on 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 the how, because then we start to understand him. And how do we do that? <laughs> Well, we do that simply by looking as much as the picture on, on the pictures or the drawings as possible. So let's start with that. Uh, and what helps is uh, looking at the literature too, because if you really want to understand something of an artist, it's very good to look at the first criticism, the first per persons who write about him. And maybe it's better not to look at the critics themselves, but to look at the artists because the artist in principle recognize something in another artist if they admire him. And this is a nice quote of uh, an artist you've probably never heard of, which is called, uh, uh, who's called August Andel. And he says that, uh, let me uh, read it, uh, that, um, uh, that, that it has, that it has, um, no composure, no noise, rather an admirable sureness and calm in spite of immense power. That's, that's a nice formulation. Granted, it was all painted in great haste, resulting in a technique that is somewhat coarse and primitive. Contours are traced in heavy outlines, which often surfaces uh, are only casually covered with strokes of color. But the curious thing is that despite all these imperfections, of this seemingly crude technique, the goal always seems to have been attained. And then he goes on, mastering even the boldest color combinations, he finds the right ones so convincingly that in spite of heavy outlines that for every other painter would tear the picture apart, he achieves this formal unity. And I've put next to it a picture that you might recognize because it's, um, it's, it's uh, the one from uh, uh, th there are several of them, but I've chosen the one, and I have to look very carefully. It's the one from Chicago, but there is also one in Boston and New York, and even in Holland. And what you recognize here is something what Endel says about Van Gogh. Uh, thick outlines, uh, flat things, and for some reason uh, you would tend to think it would fall apart, but it doesn't. And if you were talking about another uh, aspect of him, uh, it's indeed the use of uh, very strong colors, although they do not appear in his work so much uh, 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 outspoken. Uh, for some reason, he uh, managed to combine the strongest uh, colors together. Uh, and that is also one of the, uh, one of the things that Endel uh, remarks, that he, uh, he uses strong colors, but they look strong too. Not uh, uh, but but um, not so Van Gogh's. It's only when the pictures of this painter hand hangs uh, si side by side with those of others that they do appear so violent because he constantly reaches the apex of color and light. One color modifies the other. And that's really true. I mean, if you would go to, I've been to many auctions and Van Gogh's always stands out for some reason due to his color partly. Uh, but for some reason, if you look at the work itself, it's not that bold. And uh, I've put this uh, Chinese, uh, this work of a Chinese painter next to it to see how that works if you would see that, because you immediately recognize that this is done in, in the style of Van Gogh. 
Um, another quote is from Roth, uh, which is an, a Danish artist, and he says that, again, that he uses a lot of color, and he heaps one upon the other, finally pulling the brush, as it were, through a, through a porridge of them. His best pictures appear to me to be those in which one can follow the deliberate stroke of his superior big brush. Yes, this painter, who, like most of his colleagues, was an experimenter, knew exactly what a brush can achieve by, as it were, molding the thick color. And then you have to think of uh, areas like this, where you can really follow the brush stroke. And that's not the case for most of the pi uh, painters, but in the case of Van Gogh, uh, you do. You, know, so you can even see how he sculptures the color, you could even say. Well, have we now identified at all? Well, not really. <laughs> There's also something like his graphical brush stroke, which is so nicely, uh, nicely uh, formulated, you could say, by a Limonese artist, uh, uh, Mona Hatton. And evidently, this is based on his late works, especially from the Saint Remy period. You can recognize it immediately that he has this graphical swirling line uh, that. Uh, that is uh, quite unique for him. Even in pictures like that, you can recognize it. And uh, the difficult thing of these pictures is indeed that it's done very swiftly and that it's very difficult to paint wet on wet because you have to do it quickly and you have to be sure of yourself. And uh, a lot of people, a, a lot, of, uh, it's often said that Van Gogh was a mad kind of artist uh, in the sense that he, uh, uh, threw his, uh, his colors on, 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 on the canvas, but of course that's not true. Because if you paint very quickly, you have to know exactly what you're doing. Uh, I mean, if you are uh, painting slowly, you can think more. But uh, if you paint quickly, you have to already, before you make the decision to do something, you are have to know what you are going to do. So, uh, and Van Gogh knew that. That's one of his talents. Well, another fingerprint, you could say, is that although we've now said that Van Gogh had all kinds of uh, uh, elements in his identity, he could do a lot of things more. I mean, he could also paint delicate, delicately, as uh, these uh, brush strokes of uh, the orchards uh, point out. He could paint uh, in Dutch. He could also paint thin and not uh, uh, thick. Uh, and he could do swirling lines, but also for trees. And he could also have very fine lines and sunflowers. So it's not, he's certainly not an artist who has one particular style, although you can recognize in total what his identity for certain is. Here you see, for instance, that he tries to imitate uh, so-called crepons, which are Japanese wrinkled uh, prints, and he tried to follow that in his, uh, in his, uh, in his pictures uh, and his paintings of the Paris period. Until now, we've only looked at the pictures themselves, but there's, of course, more than that. We've, all, we've only looked at the formal elements. But one of the things of Van Gogh that's also quite uh, essential is that he is a realist. So, um, uh, as, as Endel, uh, the, 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 the German artist I just quoted, uh, 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 as, uh, as he wrote, as far as his motives, they are usually the very simplest. Uh, he does not need, as so many modern painters do, to go from place to place to look for something called motive. He takes what is there. And that's actually rather truth. Uh, we know from research that if Van Gogh went to certain places, then he indeed picked motives by sitting somewhere, uh, taking a motive which was in front of him, and then later on turned his back and did something on the other side. Uh, and uh, it's also a quality because you tend to think that it's realistic. You, although his pictures are, of course, uh, uh, far from academical uh, realistic, they, they, uh, they still depict uh, 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 the uh, real life, you could say. And that's why we attached, or I attached a photograph next to it. Uh, the place is still in Adel, as, as you can see on the photograph. And another identity is, of course, that, and that's very important too, that in Van Gogh's oeuvre, uh, uh, his oeuvre and his life are one. So you find many things of his life you find back in his, uh, in his pictures. 
and that has to do with the fact that simply these letters have been published. Uh, they were published already very early on in the 19th century, and the complete edition of his letters to his brother Theo were published in 1914. But from those letters, you get an idea of how he lived, why he did become a painter, and, uh, and consequently, we nowadays do read uh, his pictures and his drawings as a kind of biography, as his autobiography, you could say. And that's also uh, uh, very uh, uh, an, an, an element which is quite unique for, uh, for Van Gogh. And here you've got, I do not know if you ever visited this, uh, this website, but this is a website uh, we made, as the, the museum made that many, many years ago. And uh, you can find all these letters there in English, in French, and in, in Dutch, uh, in the original language. But you can also find for every letter uh, the pictures that he uh, describes and uh, details about dating and things like that. Okay. Now we come to the real subject, the Japanese dream. Because the Japanese dream is a bit connected to uh, I just what I just pointed, paint, uh, pointed out. Not only the forms of his pictures, but also um, something uh, connected to his life and the dreams in his life too. So what do we read here? We read here that he uh, believed when he went to the south, uh, when he went to uh, the south of France, that he would find Japan there, and that it would be colorful and cheerful and full of love. Uh, and the last quote is a very typical one, and we wouldn't be able to study Japanese art, it seems to me, without becoming much happier and more cheerful. And it makes us return to nature, despite our education and our work in a world of convention. And why is this so important? Well, <laughs> it's important on th that it says something about um, his, his, uh, his dreams in his life. But I'll start first with saying how he more or less discovered the Japanese prints. Um, it's a bit of a coincidence, actually, uh, because he bought, uh, when he was in Paris, he bought 660 prints all at once, and it had to do with the fact that he had a quarrel with his brother. His brother believed that he might kick him out of the house, and Van Gogh uh, uh, thought it wise that he should have something on the side. So he hoped, or he probably liked Japanese prints, but. He, he bought those prints simply because he hoped that he would uh, create a kind of art dealership for himself. So he started to sell them, but they were, none of them were interested. These prints uh, are very, very cheap. Uh, they cost uh, a little bit more than, uh, uh, not much more than, I think, uh, a, a drink at the bar. Uh, and he bought 660 of them, and he, uh, he only paid a small price of them because he didn't deliver the, the art dealer the rest of the money. <laughs> so 660 prints, and he didn't sell them. And then something happened important. He bought them, actually, because he had a girlfriend at the time, uh, Mrs. Uh, Agustina Secatori, who you see here. And she had a restaurant, and she had uh, a, a small room in that, which was meant uh, to show works of art that. So Van Gogh, who had uh, was quarreling with his brother, uh, did take the opportunity to show his prints there. And you can see, well, this is not actually a print, but uh, it's a painting. And I do not know whether he owned that one at the time or that he just included it. But the suggestion is that we see here Agostina Secatori uh, in her own restaurant with, uh, uh, and on the back you see the exhibition with uh, the prints. Uh, she's, of course, a very uh, liberal lady in the sense that she's smoking and she's drinking. And as you can see, she already had one beer because there are two sauces underneath the beer. What happened is, is that Van Gogh really learned something from the prints. Uh, not immediately. Uh, he took some things uh, uh, from them, but it's only at the end of the year. Uh, so after a year that he had uh, bought them and couldn't sell them, then suddenly he started to make uh, those copies. And those copies are made in, uh, uh, based on prints. And uh, the prints that he bought are uh, reasonable, cheap ones. There are, uh, and some of them are quite discolored. Uh, as you can see here on the right, so the one that is discolored is uh, the one uh, we have, and that's on the right. And the one on the left is a more perfect uh, 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 sheet of paper. Uh, 
by an, uh, a, a good collector. Uh, let me start, w sorry, I go too quickly. Uh, let me tell you something about what he did because he didn't copy it uh, directly in the sense that he corrected the colors a little bit because Van Gogh had a color theory so he adjusted the Japanese prints to the European uh, 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 color theory which meant that you do not have black, black doesn't exist so he <coughs> made uh, the tree uh, uh, purplish you could say, red purplish. Uh, he had some extra space uh, on both sides of the uh, the scene of the uh, the orchard, so he covered that with uh, characters, and that was probably an afterthought, I tend to think, because he did it on dry paint. And the addresses uh, that he put onto them, it's readable, are addresses of uh, houses of uh, in Edo, so Tokyo, of nice ladies. <laughs> and. So he liked that, and in the second, uh, the second copy that he made, he started to, uh, to, to make this more systematically. Um, the first print, yeah, so he did this more systematically. We know that he used another print uh, for, because he needed more letters, m more characters. So we know that, uh, uh, that he used another print too. Uh, we know what must be on the other print, uh, but we've never found that other print. So there's still something to search for. Uh, here again, you see that uh, the, it's the print from our museum, which is a bit discolored, and another one from the same collection. So, um, he copied those prints, and that was an important uh, uh, moment in his life, uh, because his idea changed at the time, I tend to think. And it has something to do with his longing for a primitive society. Uh, and that's what he was more or less looking forward to when he went to the south of, uh, of France. Um, because Van Gogh believed that uh, uh, he was longing for a kind of society which we would call uh, primitive in the sense that uh, it would be uh, without luxury and that it would be much more simpler and that then you would be happier as well. But there are two kinds of primitivism. You, know, you have two options uh, if you long for such a society. There is such a thing as the hard option and the soft option. And the hard option means that if you want to look for, you are searching for that kind of society, um, the uh, hard option is, is that your society means that you uh, suffer. Because suffering means that you will do away with luxury. And if you do away with luxury, it simply means that you will enjoy more the real things that you have and you know what really is essential is in life. And that's the kind of, th uh, of, of, of philosophy that Van Gogh uh, uh, treasured in his Dutch years, and the potato eaters is there the best example of. You see here people who have worked very, very hard, so they struggle, they don't have enough money to buy a luxury kind of things. Think they only can buy uh, potatoes, maybe with a little bit of butter on them, uh, but that's all they have. And, but that's good. That's, that's this suffering is good, and that's for, uh, what Van Gogh also wanted to uh, live like that. But the problem is that he went to Paris, and there it all changed. And that has something to do, I tend to think, with his future. His future as an artist wasn't a very a pleas uh, a pleasant one, because he hadn't sold anything yet. And the idea at the time was that it was not going to change. And... Uh, so what we then see is that Van Gogh started to look for other possibilities and, uh, um, and also art that is connected with a different kind of philosophy and that's the philosophy of the, uh, the soft option, so to say. So that's soft primitivism. And soft prim primitivism is the longing for a society uh, where you do not have to work at all. It's sunny. Uh, uh, there's food that simply falls from the trees. And uh, there are also, and, and love is in the air, so to say, because you've got a lot of time. And uh, so, that's, so that's connected actually to colonialism and to a certain extent to the male gaze as well. And that's expressed in pictures like this, which is more about Greece, I tend to think. But the most, the person who ex had expressed that longing the best at the time was Paul Gauguin, who had recently been to Martinique and uh, came back with pictures like this. And these are the kind of pictures that the two brothers, Theo and Vincent, were interested in and immediately bought. 
And at that time, Van Gogh um, started to, uh, uh, around that time, he started to make those pictures of the Japanese prince. So Gauguin was longing for the tropics. Uh, so that was his option for uh, a, a soft kind of primitivism. And Van Gogh hoped to find it in Japan. Uh, and you see here what Japan is all about. It's, uh, uh, you'll find it on the right. It's, it, it's a uh, late 19th century kind of print, a very cheap one as well. Uh, and uh, you see here ladies, uh, you see here uh, a lot of birds. It's colorful nature. And Van Gogh uh, tried to make his own variation with the picture on the left. Uh, of course, it's not Japan because bamboo, as you all know, is of course not growing in water. And uh, you see uh, uh, a toad on, on the, on the, on the, uh, at, at the bottom, uh, but it's not, uh, uh, it, it, it's a, uh, it is a toad, but it should, it should be, of course, a frog, but it isn't. But he took all those elements from different uh, Japanese prints. So if he wants, so, so the question now becomes, if he goes to the south, what is he expecting then, and what does this mean for his art? Uh, because we've just seen that he wants to, um, it's connected to a kind of philosophy, but it's also connected to a kind of art that is connected in his mind to uh, the pleasure and the cheerfulness that he will find in the south. Um, one of the aspects of um, I just told you of the South was is that it's colorful. So what does Van Gogh do? Well, the moment he arises, uh, arrives in, uh, arrives, uh, arrives in uh, Arles, he uh, starts to paint the, the orchards, which are, of course, full of bluesome and very colorful. And it has nothing to do, I tend to think, with the fact that these pictures uh, uh, of, of these motifs are also uh, used by the Japanese. No, it's something to do with the fact that he came to the nature, uh, to that kind of nature, to show that it was colorful. Uh, so he chose choose colorful motives, and this was the first one. The other thing he wanted to show is that that there's not so much hard work going on in the south. So, in his Dutch period, you'd seen that uh, all his peasants there are struggling, but here it's quite nice. I mean, there's a nice temperature, sun is shining. Uh, it's not hard work at all. And he, uh, in these prints, you can also see, to a certain extent, that he wants to make them look like Japanese prints because you see here that the sun behind the peasant is depicted here as a lot of birds in, uh, in, in, uh, in Japanese drawings are uh, depicted. So it's a deliberate choice. However, Although we know that Van Gogh went to the south of France and that he chose there many, mo uh, many motives that are in harmony with his philosophy, that it should uh, show the soft, uh, the soft side of uh, uh, primitivism, uh, there were things, of course, that he didn't like. But there are only two pictures that show that. And this is one of them, and, that's and this is the night cafe. And that has to do with the fact that this is not cheerful at all. And this is the place where he lived, actually. And the people who uh, he found there during the night were also the people who were staying at the bridge. So that's the reason why he described the picture on the, the, on the left as an attempt, something more heartbroken and therefore more heartbreaking. So these are only the two exceptions that do break with the Japanese dream, you could say. Uh, for the rest, it's all okay. No rain at all, for instance. He didn't depict rain, no storms. It's only sunny, friendly, and a lot of flowers. Um, now we come back to the form again. Uh, because in the form, he wanted to do something with the Japanese prints as well, which he called seeing with the Japanese eye. So that's what's formulated here. Uh, after some time, your fishing fish changes, he says. Um, he, he, by the way, he hadn't taken hardly any Japanese prints with him because he believed that he didn't need them there in the south. He c could do it with the south himself. That would bring him to, uh, you could say, to, to the Japanese prints uh, uh, immediately. That's not the case, of course, of course but I'll show, uh, I will tell you later on how, how it uh, really works. 
this whole notion of um, of changing um, and taking Japanese uh, models um, for your own art had something to do with the fact that everybody believed at the time that art had gone too far, that art was in uh, in a uh, position of decadence. Uh, since the Renaissance, uh, they had learned how to use uh, perspective, and we could do everything with it, but it's gone too far. And the generation of Van Gogh uh, believed that it's gone too far and that they had to go back to the earliest beginnings. And that means that they had to go back, for instance, to, to uh, stained glass windows. Uh, or, uh, as you can see on the right, to so-called Epinal prints, which are quite colorful. But the difference between these prints and what I've just shown you is that it's flat. And this whole generation was, uh, uh, had the idea that flatness had to, be, um, had to be put into the pictures. It had to become decorative again. And uh, one of the persons uh, which was important for Van Gogh was his friend Emile Benard, and he was one of the first who did so, so he started to make uh, stained glass windows too. And this is the kind of art which is something in between Japanese prints and stained glass windows too, but you can see that there's the reduction of, the, of perspective in it. They don't want that anymore. But how do you do that? How do you, can you do that immediately? You can do it like uh, Benar, but it's a bit boring because then it becomes a Japanese print, quite literary. And Van Gogh tried to, deal, to do it too. And he did this, for instance, uh, in a still life like this one. And it's quite, quite easy how he, how he did it. He used variations of one color. And he even used the frame, because if you put the frame in the same kind of color as you, uh, as you have in the, uh, in the image itself, it becomes flat immediately. It's not completely recognizable what the background is. The, uh, the fruit itself, of course, is recognizable. But this is, according to Van Gogh, probably a Japanese print. But we tend to think it's not, because there are no planes in it. But for him, uh, it was a picture that uh, uh, in, in which he had reduced the uh, perspective. So that made it almost like a Japanese print. And he tried to make pro progress in, in them to make them flatter. So this is what happened in, uh, in, uh, in Adel. Uh, you see that it's already flattened more on the right side and the one in which he had flattened the most and which he considered the best of everything that he did there is the sunflowers. Uh, because there, there's even uh, in, in the uh, the flowers itself are much more fl uh, flatter than the, uh, the the fruit in the in the former uh, picture uh, uh, was. So that's why this picture of the sunflowers was so important for him. It's flat. He managed something to do uh, in uh, in it uh, that um, that he uh, uh, believed uh, uh, that he was was catching up with all his friends. Uh, and even did what they considered to be childish as well. Because if you look at the uh, sunflowers themselves as well, nobody will recognize that this is an, an, a good sunflower. They don't have a green heart if the, the flowers are already gone, for instance. Uh, now, it's not so very difficult to, uh, to reduce the, uh, the perspective uh, in, in uh, still lifes, and maybe also not so very difficult to do it in portraits. Uh, these are two pictures that he made in, in, uh, in, uh, uh, when it, while he was still in Paris. And many be people believe, therefore, that uh, because this is Pere Tanguy, and Pere Tanguy is um, the art supplier for him. He bought his paint uh, and his uh, canvas uh, at his place. Uh, and he made those two uh, pictures, so everybody believes that uh, uh, Mr. Tanguy also sold prints of him. But he didn't, I tend to think. You could say that Tanguy, who also had some of the pictures of Van Gogh in his shop, uh, like the pictures of Emile Bernard and Signac, uh, that he was say that he wanted to say that, okay, I'm going to make modern art. Um, so uh, um, this is the art dealer of modern art at the time. I'm not totally sure whether that's the case, uh, because if you look very carefully, you see that. Let me see. Take a look. 
So here you see the picture of Van Gogh included within all those prints. And here you've seen the flattest of his, uh, of his still lives also included within uh, the background of all the prints. Uh, but besides the prints, there's also, also something like this, which looks like, well, what is it, a tapestry or a decoration or whatever. Um, and I tend to think what we see here is actually that he simply wanted to say it's flat. And if you look at the person itself too, he seems to be, he, he is depicted, uh, he's depicted sitting, but it's, it's uh, in, in terms of perspective, he isn't, of course. Uh, he, it looks like he's standing up. Uh, so he also here, perspective is rather missing or wrongly uh, used. Um, this, so th the association of Japanese prints lead indeed to formal innovations in his work in R2. Here you see uh, uh, a picture of uh, the son of the, the post, uh, the of, of uh, the postman, uh, Mr. Rollin. And if we would put uh, a print like this next to it, you understand that Van Gogh um, used a very cramped composition as well, and he used also yellow in the background, which is quite uncommon for for uh, for portraits. Uh, this is a very famous one, and also rather flat, yellow again. And it's not as yellow as in, this, uh, in, in the prints of Utomaro. And Utomaro was the kind of artist that Van Gogh didn't have as his, his collection because it was too expensive. But you can certainly see that th in, in these kind of prints you see that he is really trying to uh, make modern portraits that will look like Japanese prints, although there is of course the difference that they are painted in oil and they are a little bit with more impesto than the Japanese prints itself are. If we take a look at these portraits, Van Gogh does this more often, namely that you see that there are two uh, color areas and he's simply taken this, that over from Japanese prints like that, in which it signifies uh, sunset. And here you can see too that he is following Japanese prints uh, with very uh, outlining and so I do not want to suggest that um, he, he had the idea of following Japanese prints in the sense that he uh, had them in mind when he started. No, he wanted to make flat pictures. And then, of course, after a certain time, uh, having studied those prints, all the repertoire that belongs to the Japanese prints came into his hands, so you could say, and then he pr produced pictures like this. For interiors and landscape, it's of course much more difficult to uh, leave out uh, perspective because that's part of a landscape. So if you want to make a landscape uh, and then make it look like a Japanese print, it's difficult. And the best that he managed was to do it in, um, in, uh, in a technique which is more or less the same as in uh, Japanese prints, namely in watercolor and gouache. So these are the two which you could say that uh, that he comes closest to Japanese prints. And this is one of them, also in the collection of uh, him. Uh, also in this one, in interiors, he comes very close to a Japanese prints. He even writes it himself. Uh, it's very calm, he says, which is true, because for Van Gogh it's quite unusual to have a rather calm brush stroke. Remember, for instance, the, uh, uh, if you tend to think of the night cafe, much more, uh, 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 moving brush strokes going on. It's only in the in, in the cushions and the bed and this picture that there is some strong brush stroke on, uh, going on. For the rest, it's rather simple, and he did this on purpose because he wanted to express calmness in the pictures. Uh, it should uh, symbolize rest. Uh, and in you have tiles in the, in the Provencal houses, and these look like uh, wood. Uh, like a wooden uh, ground, but it isn't. Uh, he simply left it out because otherwise it would have uh, been too uh, uh, co contradictory with the idea that he should have a, a, a calm uh, background, a, a calm uh, effect. In terms of colors, it looks like this one, and then you tend to think, hey, there is purple in it, uh, or lilac, and it's, it's missing. 
Well, the trouble of the bedroom is, and maybe Gloria Groom has already told you that last time, that it's discolored. Don't be shocked, but that's the picture as it originally was. So here you see uh, the original colors. This was probably stronger, uh, but uh, and uh, we notice uh, quite simply uh, you can analyze the pigments, but it's also written in his letter. He gives a description of the picture and he describes the picture as lilac, as being in, in lilac uh, uh, pigment, uh, in, in uh, purplish and lilac uh, tints. And then it becomes clear that he evidently, in this picture, wanted to suggest that it is a bit like the pictures of uh, uh, the, 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 the Japanese prints from the second half of the 19th century, in which uh, those colors are much, much more harsh than in the prints of uh, the first half of the 19th century. So here we have it again. And the funny thing is now that we've come to a kind of contradiction. contradiction because both, of course, look like Japanese prints. This one a bit more maybe than this one, because it's a bit calmer in terms of brush stroke. Uh, this one is, and, and this one might be a Japanese print because it's supposed to be peaceful. It's supposed to be fitting in with the kind of society uh, that he was longing for, namely a rest, calmness, cheerfulness. And this one was the opposite. So this stands for the kind of society which is not uh, uh, to be linked to the Japanese prints. Uh, nevertheless, his repertoire in uh, the south of uh, Aro was, of course, like those Japanese prints, so he painted it uh, like that. And he's uh, saying uh, in the beginning that it's uh, expressing the gloominess of the place, and then he changes it, uh, 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 changes it uh, after a certain time, explaining that, well, maybe it's gloomy, but it's the kind of gloominess that is pleasant here. And that has, of course, to do with the fact that it is indeed a pleasant picture, simply because he uses colorful effects. Um, I just told you that Foucault tried to reduce the perspective in his pictures, and that he couldn't do that immediately. Uh, I go back to this one. So these are the ones that he did later on. Uh, but uh, this is the kind of picture that he had made earlier on, and you could e easily recognize that he didn't manage yet to, m to, to make uh, his pictures look like Japanese prints. Uh, but uh, it took some time for him to develop a kind of style, and that style developed actually when he went to the south of France, uh, uh, to an, an, a village in the south of France near the Mediterranean tea, Sea, namely the Sainte Marie de la Mer. And there he really started to make for the first time pictures which uh, are in coloring much more harsher than he made before, uh, and also much more abstract uh, in the sense that you can see that he thought that the composition uh, consists of different uh, areas of different colors. After that, he tried to follow Japanese prints also. You have in uh, the Japanese prints, you've got the uh, idea of uh, the helicopter view, a, a, a perspective view uh, high up, and Foucault tried to follow that quite literally in, in the one on, on, on the left. Quite unusual for him. Uh, if you would, if you want to uh, compare this picture with a Japanese print, then you would come to a print of Hoxai, and Hoxai is indeed the person that Foucault admired the most. Uh, um, he didn't own any hoxeyes because hoxey was too expensive for him. And Hiroshika, uh, he had a few pic uh, 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 prints by Hiroshika, but hoxey he missed. But hoxey is the only one, the only artist that he uh, mentions by his name. So that's the one he admired. And so it's probably also uh, uh, in his mind when he made the, uh, the, the, the harvest on the left. We tend to think that everything that he made in, in the south of France is, is connected to the Japanese. Well, some motives are not, as I told you. Uh, so there are a few motives that are not connected to the Japanese dream. Uh, there are also a lot of pictures that are not connected in terms of form as well. So this one, you could not really connect to a Japanese print. I do, however, believe that Foucault would call it a Japanese print as well, because he believes simply that it's decorative but it's now done with a much more uh, 
um, impressive brush stroke than in the other pictures. Uh, and in fact, that brush stroke is here uh, influenced by an, an artist called Monticelli. But although it, it, it's different, it, it doesn't have all those uh, uh, areas of one particular color, it's flat nevertheless. And the flatness, you have to remember, was part of the Japanese prints. And he did that in, in one of the pictures that, that's in the show as well, the one on the left. And you can also see it uh, in, in flower pictures like that. Depicting flowers is, uh, by the way, also a motif which he thought was quite essential for the South. He had hoped to find in the South of France a lot of flowers because he believed that it would be like Japan. So he was rather disappointed that he couldn't find flowers because they dry out in the summer. And uh, so what he did do is then go to uh, uh, those little gardens of uh, individuals to depict flowers. And so he made a few marvelous pictures of uh, flower gardens, uh, but actually because he couldn't find them. So now we come to the drawings, uh, of which we have a few in the exhibition. And um, in the, uh, in the uh, I think in the exhibition we, oh, I think I have to rush a little bit. Uh, we, with the, that, um, we see here the drawing style of Van Gogh. And the drawing style of Van Gogh is quite sensational in the sense that he does something that nobody else does at the time. He calls this a Japanese uh, this is a drawing in the Japanese style. And is this correct? No, it's not really, uh, which is a bit funny, because he already uh, did, well, didn't draw in, in that mode, but he made paintings in that style, because this is a picture that he made in Paris already, and that's a loose variation of uh, working in the neo-impressionistic style, so not using dots so much, but lines. And then if you would make that black, you get that, and that's quite the same as that one. So when he talks about that he was going to draw in the Japanese style, um, you could say that it was already Japanese when he didn't want to call it Japanese. So he made drawings like that, which are brilliant, done with a reed pen. Most of them are, by the way, in black inked, uh, but they discolor after a certain time, so then they start to look a little bit more like the, the drawings of Rembrandt. Uh, this he called uh, and uh, this is quite close to uh, b books of Hoxheis uh, that he know using dots he starts to because he makes those drawings in the Japanese style and then he starts to stylize them and he stylizes them towards Hoxheis uh, too uh, you could say and the drawing you just said uh, you just saw was uh, a picture uh, of which he wrote, it doesn't look Japanese, and it's actually the most Japanese thing that I've made. And here you see another, th so this is rather blackish, but most of them, uh, so he's used uh, ink here that didn't uh, become brown. And then you tend to think, oh, what he actually was imitating is uh, 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 paintings in the uh, Chinese style, which is this one, of which I've got an example on the left one. Uh, we didn't know whether Van Gogh had saw them, but they were, were quite uh, popular. So with his, uh, his shorthand kind of drawing, this comes very close. And of course, drawings like this and that. Uh, this one has got a border, which is like Japanese prints. I'll rush a little bit. Um, so that's what he all tried to do in, in the south of France, in form. Uh, they should look like Japanese prints, but, but as a main aim, uh, to get rid of the perspective in it as much as, as much as possible without losing, of course, that you can't see anymore what the motive would be. And on the other hand, it had to look like a society that he thought was nice to live in because he needed that as a rather depressed kind of person. Well, we all know what happened. Uh, cut off his ear. And then he made this picture. And then the question is, does this mean that the Japanese dream has ended? Well, here probably not yet because he puts the prints, which signifies the, the Japanese, oh, sorry, the, the Japanese uh, dream for him in the back. So this one, it's a print that he took with him. He probably wanted to say, no, the dream will help me to go on. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a person who, uh, who don't have hopes for the future, so I need to live in, in a country which is pleasant for me to, to live in, 
or in an area uh, or in, in, the, in the countryside uh, which is pleasant to live in. Uh, and by making or drawing and painting a society that I like to live in, that helps me too. Um, so it probably means here that despite the fact that he became ill, uh, he's still hoping that he will go on. But we all know what happened. After the attack, there came another attack, and then he finally went into the asylum, and in the asylum it all changed. And then he had the idea, of course, that um, it was all due to the fact that he tried to make, uh, to look his work like Japanese prints because he put too much fantasy in his work, because that's what you do. So if you put too much fantasy in your work, uh, that might have caused the illness. That at least was his idea. And so what he had to do is to calm down. And what does this mean, meant for him? Well, it meant actually that he um, didn't uh, want to paint in the Japanese style anymore. So no blocks, no, no uh, harsh coloring anymore. And also uh, new motives in the sense that because now he was really depressed and his eye rested on storms and rain and other subjects, occasionally also more uh, beautiful subjects as well. But while in, uh, in, uh, in Arl he has never uh, painted uh, one uh, picture with rain, now that you've got several of them, and storms as well. In, in terms of forms, it simply goes on. Uh, this is a small picture that he made at the time, and it's evidently based on, uh, at least the form is based on the, uh, Japanese prints like this one, of which we've got two in our collection, a so-called Loperella, Loperella uh, album. And we've got this picture. Many people always tend to think, oh, this is the most Japanese picture that he made. I'm going to. Um, Actually, it, it, it might signify for him the Japanese dream because it's, it has a kind of youth and, and freshness in it because of the motive. But in terms of form, it's rather realistic because there's a lot of perspective in it. In fact, if this picture is su such a good picture because there is air in it, you feel that you are uh, outside. Uh, but if we want to put a print next to it, well, it looks a bit like that. But it's less, it's, it's the flatness is certainly not the same. And uh, you see that this goes on in Ofer Suwas as well, where he moved to after he thought that he was well, not really cured, but that he had to leave the asylum because he couldn't stand the patients anymore. And then, <laughs> yeah, well, for somebody who is not, uh, uh, who has attacks and is in between. Uh, uh, well, healthy and, and, and not uh, confused, it's very difficult to, lef, to live uh, uh, with real patients. Uh, they're frightening, they shout, uh, and they do not help you uh, if you want to work to go on with working, and that was one of his problems. In the beginning, he, he, th he thought it would be wise to go to the asylum because he believed that he would have the time and, and become more calm to work, but after a certain time, the patients didn't help him with that, so then he decided to leave. Uh, these are pictures that he made in Offer, and I've put prints around them because he uh, evidently had the, these kinds in, in mind. He made uh, still, uh, uh, it's one of the aspects I didn't talk about, uh, uh, putting something in the foreground is typical for Japanese prints, and he did that occasionally. It's also shared by Impressionists, so I'm not totally sure whether for Hoff that only typical for Japanese only, but it's certainly the source for these kinds of tricks. And evidently what he has lived, you can s uh, sum up with two nice drawings. This is a drawing that he made when he arrived in, uh, in Paris on the left. It's uh, Chardin du Luxembourg. And on the left side, we've got, oh, I'm sorry, that goes too quickly. And on the right side, we've got the city hall in Offer. And what we see here is actually what he learned by looking at Japanese prints. It becomes more abstract, more decorative. He's thinking much more in, in areas. So, uh, and th the other one is much more detailed. And this is one of the pictures which uh, you could call Japanese prints because it's linked indeed with this kind of, uh, of prints that he owns. Uh, but there is, of course, a big difference between those kinds of prints and Van Gogh because. We all know that Japanese uh, artists made prints uh, and they were craftsmanship. And in fact, a print was not made by the artist, it was made by a combination of people. It was first of all ordered by somebody. 
So there was a publisher who wanted to have a motive because he believed that he should uh, bring it onto the market. And he went to an artist who looked in tourist book to find a motive for his own to put to make a print. Then he would send his drawing to uh, a wood uh, person who would cut the wood blocks. And then there was another person who would print it. Uh, so there were many people involved in a world like that. And Van Gogh believed that it was only done by the artist uh, who made the drawing. Which of, which of course is not true. And another thing is of course that the, there's, a, there's a different tradition behind it in the sense that uh, the Japanese artist is the craftsmanship who d doesn't think that he will put his emotion into his work. And in the case of Van Gogh, we all experience this work as somebody who has, well in this case, it's difficult to express, but we tend to think that there is a certain uh, uh, sadness uh, in it and uh, 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 he, he, he made many of those empty landscapes in the last weeks before he decided to take his own life and this is one of them and I tend to think it refers to, uh, to the fact that there was rain in his heart. <laughs>